So let's read together a few verses in Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, starting at verse 1. For this reason we should give heed more abundantly to the things we have heard, lest in any way we should slip away. For if the word which was spoken by angels was firm, and every transgression and disobedience received just retribution, how shall we escape if we have been negligent of so great salvation, which having had its commencement in being spoken of by the Lord, has been confirmed to us by those who have heard, God bearing besides witness with them to it, both by signs and wonders and various acts of power and distributions of the Holy Ghost according to his will. For he has not subjected to angels the habitable world which is to come, of which we speak, but one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that thou rememberest him, or son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him some little inferior to the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, and hast set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he has left nothing unsubject to him. But now we see not yet all things subjected to him, but we see Jesus, who was made some little inferior to angels on account of the sufferings of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he should taste death for everything. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make perfect the leader of their salvation through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and those sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly will I sing thy praises. So we'll stop here, the reading of the scriptures. This wonderful epistle can really be titled, according to what we read in verse 8, We See Jesus. This is open heaven. In Luke 24 and in Acts 1 we see how the Lord Jesus was lifted up by God. And in John 20 he said that he would ascend. He spoke to Mary. And there we see how he ascended. And now the heavens are opened. Because now we see the Lord Jesus crowned with glory and honor at God's right hand. He was rejected here on earth. Rejected by his own people. But now he is crowned by God as we have read with glory and honor. And from the open heaven the Lord Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit. Acts 2. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in the believers. Acts 2. And the Holy Spirit dwells now in the church, in the assembly, in the believers individually. And so that's a wonderful privilege to have the open heaven, to have the link with the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit and through faith of course, and see Him as He is right now in glory. We have seen in chapter 1 the introduction that emphasizes his greatness. His greatness in seven different ways. We have seen the heir of all things before God made anything. He was the heir, established by God as the heir. And we have seen seven points in the beginning of chapter 1 that summarizes his greatness. And now we see him there at God's right hand in chapter 1 verse 3. He set himself down, we talked about that, at God's right hand. It's amazing. All these details, beloved, you can study. God made him to sit down. 
But he also could sit down himself. And that's what we see here. That shows the greatness of the person who could sit down at God's right hand. It's amazing. And then the last time, we've seen those seven passages quoted from the Old Testament that shows how great he is. Greater than the angels. In Judaism, the angels had a very high ranking position. There were all kinds of theories about the angels. And some believe in seven hierarchies and so on. There were all kinds of speculations. But also in the scriptures we see that the angels have a very prominent place. It was through the angels that the law was given to Israel. God used angels to uh, commit the law to Moses and Moses to the people. And so the angels had a very high position in Judaism. Now what we have seen the last time on, on the list, and I, I copied that again on the other side, the unsurpassable greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. This epistle, Hebrews, is not giving new revelations. That's why we don't have the name of a specific apostle attached to it. The apostle is the Lord Jesus. We hope to see that in chapter 3. And so all the emphasis is on his person. But of course he has used a human vessel. And that is Saul, Saul who became Paul. And we talked about that the first session and the second session a little bit, I think. Because he had seen the Lord in the glory. No other had seen the Lord there in the glory on the way to Damascus. And so he writes now about these better things. He was taught in Judaism. But he saw now how this Judaism was replaced by God with better things. And I explained that on the first page a little bit. Yeah, there's better things. You can go over it quietly at home. You can see then how these better things are really all connected with the Lord Jesus, the better person. And we mentioned, perhaps I'll mention that the name, uh, again tonight, the name Jesus. We'll talk about that in verse 8. And it's all connected with this wonderful person. But my point is this now, that he does not give new revelations in this epistle. The Holy Spirit led the author to take the Old Testament scriptures to show how these scriptures already spoke of him in the Old Testament. And that's why we have seen those seven quotes in chapter 1. That's why we're going to see tonight also quotes from the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is now come to life as it were. It's similar to what the Lord Jesus did with the disciples from Emmaus. You know the story of Luke 24. It's a very amazing how they were discouraged and how the Lord Jesus made them talk. They expressed what was in their heart. And then the Lord Jesus talked to them about the scriptures. He talked about himself, how the scriptures, Moses' writings, the prophets, the other writings, Psalms, would speak about him. And he showed that. He didn't speak about himself. He spoke about the scriptures concerning himself. And when they heard that, what happened? Their hearts started to burn in them. Do you know, that is this epistle. The Lord wants our hearts to make burn. If you read an epistle like this, this Hebrews, our hearts start to burn because they respond to his greatness. That is what we find in this. And that is what the author by the Holy Spirit was trained to do. He learned from the Lord Jesus. He could do what the Lord Jesus did in Luke 24. Paul did it in his time in the book of Acts and in the epistles. He took the Old Testament and showed how it speaks of the Messiah. Now of course the Holy Spirit used Paul also to bring new, new revelations. But that's not the topic of Hebrews. That is like Ephesians, Colossians, Romans and other epistles. And there it is very important that he is introduced as an apostle with the authority that God had given him as an apostle. But here he writes as a teacher. And actually he's not only writing, we'll see that in a few moments. He is speaking to us. A letter 
He has a written letter and at the same time he is speaking. And you see that right away already in verse chapter 2 verse 2 of which we speak. Um, in verse 1 and so on. So I'll go back to, to that in a moment. But just this point now. He is speaking. And so what we have in this epistle, we have a letter. But at the same time it's like sermon, discourse, a presentation. And this presentation is all about the Lord Jesus. So this is a written word and while the author is writing it's like he's speaking to us. It's very lively. Okay? So let's go to verse 1. Verse 1 to verse 4 is like a parenthesis. Something that is put in between. And I, I, you can see that if you go to chapter 2 verse 5 for he has not subjected to angels the habitable world which is to come of which we speak that connects immediately verse chapter 1 verse 14 are they not all ministering spirits sent out for service on account of those who shall inherit salvation there is salvation connected with the world to come the millennium that God will bring in this wonderful salvation over the whole earth and that is then continued in chapter 2 verse 5 quoting Psalm 8 so the topic continues and he is speaking that's not the point in verse 1 and in verse 5 he is speaking and it says we speak so the author is writing and at the same time he is speaking but the way he says it, we speak, he gets his audience involved. It's like an interaction. He's speaking to the believers, and we'll see uh, other times who these believers were. But he's speaking to these believers, the Hebrew Christians, and I mentioned that also on the outline. And he gets them to warm up, as it were, to, to get enthusiastic about what they had. And that is why it's so important to see the beginning of this chapter after this wonderful presentation of the greatness of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, as we have in chapter 1. He is Son of God in manhood. That's a bit difficult to understand. When Psalm 2, Psalm 2 we see that He is the Son of God as a man. And the Jews were familiar with that. When the Lord Jesus met Nathaniel in John 1, Nathaniel realized that the Lord Jesus, he expected the Messiah as the Son of God, according to Psalm 2. But what we have seen in Psalm, in, excuse me, in Hebrews 1 also, he is not only as a man called the Son of God, he was the Son of Mary, he was the Son of Adam, in Luke 3, he is also called the Son of God, as a man. But what we have seen in Hebrews 1 is that he is God the Son. He is God himself. We have seen how the Trinity is involved in this. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the emphasis in Hebrews 1 is on the Son. The heir of all things, the Creator and so on. And so there we have seen then the greatness of the Son of God who is God blessed over all. Not lower than God, He is God. So it's a bit difficult. So as a man He is also called Son of God, but at the same time He is God Himself blessed over all. He is God. And that's what we have seen in chapter 1, that God spoke in Son. So God is speaking in Son. God is there who is speaking. We saw that in chapter 1. And so, what we have seen the last time, this person is the same as Jehovah or Yahweh. The Jews did not pronounce the holy name of God, so we don't know for sure whether it was Yahweh. Some have made it like Jehovah, but it's an artificial form that's based on the way the Jews read Adonai. They use the same vowels to uh, pronounce Jehovah that way. But anyway, that's an artificial form to get those four letters. There's just four letters 
in Hebrew. And that name is Jehovah. And what we've seen at the last time in Hebrews 1, the Lord Jesus is Jehovah. He is this blessed God. So He is the Creator. We've seen He is above time. He is above everything. And He is Jehovah Himself. So He is the Son to whom God speaks. Psalm 45, we saw that. But He is also Jehovah Himself. So that is a summary of Hebrews 1, to show the greatness of the Lord Jesus. And after the presentation of that greatness, then the author takes a pause. He's saying as well, now what are we going to do with that? Chapter 2 verse 1 to 4 is really speaking about how do we respond to that? And so he says in verse 1, I'll just check my other translation as well. In Hebrews 2, Therefore, so for this reason, so there's the connection with what went before, we ought or we should give heed more diligently or more earnest or more abundantly. That is very interesting. We see here what we must do. We must or we should. The way it's written here, we, literally it says we must be earnest about it. We must give more serious attention. That form is used 77 times in the New Testament. This is connected to this responsibility. We must. And then, what the author says here, take heed. It's interesting that this expression to take heed or to pay attention is used seven times just in Paul's writings. But now you see what I mentioned earlier, we should give heed. So he includes himself with the audience. Of course he himself needs to give heed, but he includes himself with the audience. He's not speaking from a high throne. No, oh, you better, you better pay attention. No, he speaks himself including. We must take heed. You see how, how gracious that is? He does not speak to them and preaching to them. He joins them and he says, we must pay attention. And that is very good. With Paul we see that many times. He places himself beside the audience. Not above, but beside them. And the encouragement that is needed for them is also needed for himself. And so that is how the author teaches us and speaks about our responsibility and our response. Because this is really a matter of response. The things we have heard, how do we respond? Do we pay attention? Do we go on with that? Or do we let them slip? Do we deviate? Do we let them go? And that is a very serious matter because he says in verse 2, For if the word which was spoken by angels was firm, and that's a reference to the law of Moses and other interventions that God used the angels, and when God used the angels, the word that was spoken by them was firm, sought, no question asked. Now if that was the case, how much more then this what was given now with the Lord Jesus? And there's a little uh, line in between. He says that every transgression and disobedience received just retribution. In other words, when the law was given, you can see that in Exodus and also in Deuteronomy, that God was very serious about this, that any deviation would have very serious consequences. Transgression is a misstep. It's an action. Disobedience can translate in an action, but it's also an attitude. No way. If God speaks, like He did in the Old Testament, the option of disobedience is not there. The option to transgress, or to misstep, or to sidestep, God does not want that either. It's a no-no. Now, if that was the case under the law of Moses, he says here in verse 3, how shall we escape? Again, he includes himself, we. 
How shall we escape if we have been negligent of so great salvation? Now, why was this salvation so great? The word salvation is used seven times in Hebrews, and I mentioned chapter 114 is it one reference that it's in connection with the future. The word salvation is very rich, but it is connected with the person who presents that salvation. He is the Savior, and He brought the message of salvation. And now the question is, if we would neglect it, if we would despise that great salvation, why was it so great? Because it was spoken by the Lord Himself. Do you see that in verse 3? In this book, God is the speaker. We've seen it in chapter 1. The Lord Jesus is the speaker. The Holy Spirit is the speaker. We'll see that in chapter 3 and 4. The apostles are speakers. And here saw Paul, the writer, is the speaker. But here... The reference is to the Lord Jesus. This great salvation of which we speak in this book, he says, is spoken of by the Lord. So it's not only given by angels. You better listen if God uses angels to communicate his thoughts. But this message was given by the Lord himself. And he spoke, as we have seen. He is God who speaks. And he was as a man on this earth. In the Gospels you can see how he spoke. And how he brought this message of salvation to us. Here Paul connects himself with the Jewish people. They were very privileged. We see that in John 1... Not only that the Lord Jesus is seen as the great creator God, he is seen as the one who came to Israel and they did not accept him. So the us here is really the Jewish people. And what he says here in verse 3 is important. The message, this, this salvation was spoken by the Lord and it was confirmed to us. How was it confirmed? Two ways. By those who have heard. So now you go to the book of Acts. You see the first believers there, the, the, the twelve apostles, including Matthias, um, from chapter 1. You see the twelve, spe Peter speaking with them in Acts 2. What happened there? They confirmed to the Jews what had happened. So here you have the Gospels, the Lord Himself spoke. And that was a sure word. No question, nothing left uncertain. And you know what happened in the book of Acts? The Lord Jesus kept speaking. His nation rejected Him. But in the book of Acts you see that He kept speaking to them. So this speaking continued all the way. Including Hebrews here. But my point is now, it started, the speaking started by the Lord on earth, and then that ministry was rejected. I refer to John 1, he came to his own, and they did not know him. There were only a few who accepted him, who listened, who had faith, who accepted him. And they were the ones then who were used by God to confirm God's message to the next generation. You have here several generations. It started with the Lord. He spoke. Then, those who accepted that message and were sent by the Lord, the twelve, they confirmed it to us. So, Paul includes him in that next generation who had received it from the apostles. You can see that in the book of Acts. Paul had never seen the Lord during his earthly ministry on earth, as far as we know. But he met the Lord in the glory. And so when he had met the Lord in the glory, we see in Acts how he met Peter and James and also Barnabas and many others. And Peter and John, we can read it in Galatians 2, they confirmed to Paul what they already received from the Lord. 
And so, those who have heard it from the Lord immediately, they had confirmed it to the next generation. Just a little point here, that is still going on today. That same process, what came from the Lord, was confirmed by those who have heard it from Him and then continued, uh, passed it on to the next generation. It's an ongoing process. You see that in 2 Timothy 2. When Paul speaks to his son Timothy, he, he uh, exhorts him or encourages him to pass on to the next generation what, he, what Timothy had learned from Paul. So they have already three generations. And then they would pass it on to a fourth generation. And so it goes on. That's what you have here. It started with the Lord. He uh, used the twelve to pass it on to the people, to us. And then he used those who have heard, like Paul, to pass it on to the next generation. Now, one more thing about verse 3. By those who have heard. The ear is very important. It, uh, striking to me that the verb to hear is used 42 times just in Paul's writings, including Hebrews. Just a little point here. If we don't believe that Paul wrote this epistle, you don't get those sevens. But if you know that Paul wrote it, then to me it is very striking that just this example, this one example of this verb to hear, if you include Hebrews, you get 42 times. If you don't include Hebrews, you don't get that 42. Okay? So there's just a little point that is an indirect uh, sign to me that this was also uh, written by Paul. But anyway, that is a topic we can discuss uh, later. The point is now here that they have heard and what they have heard they pass on to the next generation. See? The Lord, the Apostles, Paul, and it goes on. Now we come to verse 4. God bearing besides witness with them. That's a very interesting expression. So, there was a testimony, it started by the Lord. It was confirmed by the twelve. It was passed on to others, and Paul is included in the other, others. And now, what do we see? God is at work. At the same time, God is at work. This was already predicted by the Lord in Mark 16. You can read Mark 16 in detail, and there you see how the Lord Jesus predicted this. That the Lord, God Himself, would confirm through miracles, we'll talk about those miracles in a moment, and other ways He would confirm this new message. So what you have here in verse 4 is an additional testimony. Not that it is less important, but it's an additional testimony. It's a testimony given by God Himself. That's now the point here in verse 4. And how does God give the testimony? So just let me repeat this. The testimony was sold, was given by the Lord, given by the Twelve, uh, passed on through Paul and others. It's very solid. But on top of that, it is confirmed by, by God. The word confirm or make certain is used seven times in different forms in Hebrews. It's a very important thought. God wants to have things solid. No, no things that are not sure, you know. God is the one who wants to make things sure. And that's what we see here. God gives over and above, over and above what we have seen, a testimony to confirm that this is really his thing, if I may use that expression, that this new testimony came from God. It was rejected by the Jewish people, it was rejected by the religious leaders, by the political leaders of the day, the different forms of leadership, they all had rejected it. But God says, no way, I am confirming this new testimony. And he does that to confirm these new witnesses. The new witnesses that we saw earlier in verses one, 2 and 3, the 12 
and our Paul also, they get an additional testimony. God himself. God is like a witness to them. They were witnesses to God. They were witnesses to the Lord Jesus to give a testimony. But God gives them witness from heaven. God says, you know what? I confirm what you are doing. And God used those miracles to confirm the testimony. So I repeat, it was rejected by the Jewish people. In the Gospel you see how the Lord Jesus confirmed His new testimonies through many different ways. And they still rejected it. And now He was cast out, He was crucified, He was buried, and they thought He was still in the tomb or stolen somewhere. But He was raised and put the highest place in heaven by God and God gives this testimony about His Son and confirms to the believers that this is really the truth and what they are saying is really backed up by God Himself and so God backs them up, if I may use that expression in four different ways He backs them up by signs signs is uh, Something that means something. If you have a road sign, you know it points to something. And these signs that the Lord Jesus did, you find, for example, in John's Gospel, you find seven signs, miracles also, of course, but these signs meant something. They pointed to something. They pointed to the Lord Himself. They pointed to this new age that we're seeing in chapter 2, verse 5, and so on. They pointed to something. And God gave those signs. Secondly, they were wonders. They were spectacular events. People realized this is something special. That is what the term wonder means. So it speaks to the mind, the signs. It speaks also to the emotions, to the senses. This is very impressive. When you see in Acts 3, this man was a paralytic. Through a miracle, Peter gave his, hold his hand, he stood fast, and he could run. He could dance and, and jump. The Lord in the glory had done that miracle. You can see that in Acts 3. And so God is bearing witness through these signs and wonders during the ministry of the Lord Jesus on this earth but not only then, also in the book of Acts because chapter 2 verse 4 here includes what was going on in those days in the book of Acts those signs were rejected by the people but God says, you know what, I give signs again and that's what you have in the book of Acts God gave wonders again through Peter also through Paul And various acts of power. That's an expression of the dynamics you find here, the power of God at work. These three words are used in connection with the Lord Jesus. Uh, I'll just read to you Acts 2, where Peter was summarizing this in his message on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. It's a very important statement that Peter made. Peter, summar Peter summarized the Lord's ministry on this earth in Acts 2 and then he said in verse 22 men of Israel hear these words Jesus the Nazarene a man born witness to by God to you by works of power and wonders and signs they have those three expressions in a different order which God wrought by him in your midst as you yourselves know this is a summary of the Lord's ministry on this earth. And what happened? They rejected him. In verse 23 he says, Him given up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye by the hand of lawless men have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God has raised up. Now he was risen, and now he's in heaven. So now we continue in Hebrews 2. Now he's in heaven, and from heaven he continues to work. And that's according to Mark 16. And that is what we have here. God confirmed that the Lord Jesus is really His man. And God confirmed that by these signs, wonders and various acts. 
And that's what we see Peter doing in the book of Acts. That's what we see Paul doing. He refers to that also in 2 Corinthians. And distributions of the Holy Ghost. So these are actions by the Holy Spirit. In different way you find these actions of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is now on this earth. The Lord is in heaven. A man seated at God's right hand. And now on earth, a divine person on this earth, that is the Holy Spirit. And that is the distributions that you find him doing from Acts 2 to now. According to God's will. That's important. This was not just a desire of the apostles. It was all done according to God's will. And so that includes this whole testimony, this whole summary that we have here in verses uh, 3 and 4, is according to God's will. And that is why this is so great salvation. Because it's so much greater than what God expressed of His will in connection with the giving of the law. This is much more, much greater, much more wonderful. So what are we going to do about this? That's the question that Paul asks. Are we going to neglect? See, that's why I put those seven points on the outline. It's not for tonight, but you can go over it in your spare time. But there are dangers. The first danger is to be negligent. That is chapter 2 verse 1. And so then you see the list of seven points. The danger is to turn away, to fall, or to fall away, or to sin willfully, or to tread underfoot the Son of God, or to refuse Him that speaks. We'll see that in the course of Hebrews, those seven warnings. And this is the first warning. There are also, in the middle of this page, you can see, or the end of this, there are five passages that are really warning passages. What we have tonight, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, is the first warning passage. Why is that so important? It is to make us realize that we have a responsibility. If God gives so wonderful things, the question is, what are we going to do with these things? He thinks that are better than Judaism. Judaism had rejected the Messiah. And now they had something better. Okay? So that is really um, Hebrews. These better things. And the question is, how do we respond to these things? And then he goes on in chapter 2, verse 5, 4. And so I mentioned that already earlier, but that is very important to us to understand. Now he makes the connection with the end of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 14, speaks about the angels. And now here in chapter 2, verse 5, he continues to speak about the angels. Okay? But, at the same time, there's a difference. In chapter 1, the angels were shown to be less than the Son of God. Even as a man, if we see the Lord Jesus as a man, Son of God, the angels are lower than He is. We have no problem to understand that. We accept that. We saw that the last time. But now the next point is, the angels, chapter 2 verse 5 and following, are also set under the Son of Man. Okay? So just let me come back to what I said earlier. The Jews were familiar with Psalm 2. That the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. And when the Lord Jesus met Nathaniel in John 1, at the end of John 1 you can see that the Nathaniel was meditating under a tree, and then the Lord saw him there, and the Lord starts to speak to him. Truly, a, um, an Israelite in whom there is no fraud. Wow, how that's possible. How does he know me? So he, Nathaniel says, You must be the Messiah. You must be. Yeah, that's true. But I tell you, the Lord says, just summarize it now in John 1. You'll see greater things than these. You'll not only see the Son of God, me as the Son of God, as a man the son, being the Son of God. He's also the eternal Son, of course. Don't misunderstand that. But Nathaniel had to understand that the Lord Jesus is presenting himself as the Son of Man, who goes even higher than Psalm 2. And that is now the topic of these verses that we have read in Hebrews 2, verse 5 to 10. 
that the Lord Jesus as the Son of Man is higher than the angels. And we saw the last time already that the angels in the order of creation are higher than human beings. And now the Lord Jesus, He becomes a man. I use the term with reverence when I say the Lord Jesus became a human being. He is God blessed over all. But He also became a man. The incarnation is a mystery. So He was spirit, soul and body, a perfect man. We'll see later in this chapter, without sin. Nothing connected with our sinful condition. He was different, but yet perfect man. And this is the point that uh, the, the Apostle wants to bring across here. As man, he's higher than the angels. Although in the order of creation, that's not the case. And so then he makes the link with Psalm 2. Uh, Psalm 8 about the world to come. And you see this expression here in Hebrews 2 verse 5. Not to angels has he subjected the world to come. The world here, th th this word world to come, or habitable world, is one word in, word in the Greek, oikomene. And that means really a house where you dwell. The Roman Empire was called the Ecumene, the habitable world. It was like compared with a house. And the people felt comfortable there. That was their house. That's where they lived. And so the world to come, also in the millennium, will be like wrong, a, a, a rule. The Roman Empire is a counterfeit. The rule of the Lord will be God's concept. And that's the habitable world that Psalm 8 speaks about. And that habitable world, that oikumene or oikumene, is still to come. It's not there yet. We saw in chapter 1 verse 14, uh, sent out, the angels are sent out for service on account to those who shall, future, shall inherit salvation. It's not there yet. And so this world to come is not there yet either of which we speak. And then he quotes in verse uh, 6, he quotes Psalm 8, What is man? That thou rememberest him, or son of man, that thou visited him. Now we have to go to the Hebrew, I'll just summarize it. There are two different terms that are used here. In the Greek text here, both are translated man. But in the Hebrew, in Psalm 8, you have the first references to Enos, mortal man, weak man. The second reference here in Psalm 8 is the Son of Man. You see in the way it's quoted here, what is man? That is Enos, the weak man, that thou rememberest him. Secondly, or Son of Man, so there's a parallel. But the parallel also includes a contrast, because now he's talked about the son of Adam, son of man. Literally it is here, son of Adam. And that is a term that is used for the Lord Jesus in Daniel 7. Those who have studied prophecy, Daniel 7 is a key chapter that shows how the son of man will rule over the whole world, over the nations, over Israel, but also over the nations. That is the Son of Man we're talking about here. That's the Son of Man in Psalm two, uh, Psalm eight. So Nathaniel had to learn that the Messiah, Psalm two, is the Son of God, but he also had to learn that the Messiah is the Son of Man, who is in that sense even higher than the one mentioned in Psalm two. And actually, God had this in mind already in Genesis 1. When he put Adam over the work of his hand, God put Adam there, he had this in mind, to put everything under the feet of a man. But Adam failed. And so here what we see, God introduced the man of his choice. And this Psalm 8 gives a testimony to that. Some believe that it is just speaking about human beings. But Psalm, two, Psalm 8 excuse me, goes much further than just a human being. It goes about the Lord Jesus who is 
going to have this place that God had in mind already for Adam, who failed, and that the Lord Jesus will take that place, the one who never fails, He will take that place that God already planned so long ago. And so, He is crowned with glory and honor. And we'll see then that He was made a little inferior than the angels. And we'll see why. That is because of death. Angels cannot die. But the Lord Jesus, although He is God blessed over all, He also became a man. And as a man, He was going to die. That was God's plan. That He would die for all. Suffer death for all. That doesn't mean that everyone will be saved. That's a topic by itself. But... He was able to die. That's the point. You see that already in Luke 2. When the Lord Jesus was laid in the manger, the angels told the shepherds that they would find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. But the swaddling cloths was really the towels that were used to bury the dead in those places there where Mary and uh, Joseph were put under for the night. That was the kind of garments that they would recognize. This baby came to die. Here the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, came to die. And of course, in that death He would glorify God. In that death He would do everything that was needed for our salvation. But in that death He would be lower than the angels. Because the angels cannot die. But that limits itself, of course, to the death of the cross and then the burial. And then the Lord rose again in wonderful magnificence, the day of His resurrection. But for a while, for a short time, He was a little bit lower than the angels. But now, what does verse 7 say? Thou hast crowned Him with glory and honor. The word glory is used seven times in Hebrews. The word honor, if you conduct all the different forms, also seven times. And hast set him over the works of thy hands. So Adam failed, the first Adam failed. But now God says, I have another man. I put him over the works of my hands. The Lord Jesus, the great administrator. God put everything in his hands. There's a beautiful verse in John 3.35 that the Father has given all into the hands of the Son. Here, the Father can do that with confidence. He has put everything to, uh, into His hands. He set Him over the works of God's hands. So, because He's the, good, the great administrator, the Lord Jesus, you can, God had confidence in the Lord Jesus. The first Adam failed, but here, the last Adam, He never failed. God expresses His confidence. In this great administrator. And verse 8 says, Thou hast subjected all things under his feet. This word, to subject, and also 40 times in Paul's writings. It's amazing. And then, under his feet. So it would be interesting to study all those verses that speak about the feet of the Lord Jesus. But I mentioned already John 1, 51, where the Lord spoke to Nathaniel, and that he would speak about this event, that the angels would then ascend and come down on, on him. That is the person that we find here. To his feet, on his feet, under his feet, God has put everything, subjected everything. And Paul makes a statement here in the middle of verse 8. For in subjecting all things to him, he has left nothing unsubject to him. It's a very sweeping statement. It is to show the greatness of the person here. That there is a man now and God puts everything under his feet. But there are two exceptions. We don't read them here. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes 
and that's very evident, there's one exception. God, who made everything subject to him, of course God is exempt from this submission. God is not subject to the Son of Man. The other exception is in Ephesians 1. At the end of Ephesians 1, you see that Paul writes about the Lord Jesus, now seated at God's right hand in the glory, that all is subject to him under his feet, except for the assembly. The bride, his wife, she will be beside him. She will be the queen beside him, not at his feet. Even the old rabbis understood that already. When Adam received his bride, Eve, in chapter 2, they said, God didn't take her from his feet so that he would step on her. He didn't take her from his head so that she would rule over him. The rabbis understood that. He, he, Genesis 2 makes that very clear. God took from the side, the rib, and from that rib he built Eve. God's the wonderful builder. He built Eve. It's amazing. And that's not the point. The Lord Jesus has everything under his feet. But the assembly will be beside him. So that's the other exception. But here is a very general statement. All things are subject to him under his feet. And then he goes on. And that's important for us. But now we see not yet all things subject to him. The Jews were familiar with the past, the world that then was. The world of Noah's days that disappeared in the flood. And then they knew the present age in which they were living. And then the world to come. You'll see that in Hebrews 6 also in other references. There are many references to the world to come. That's a future age. And so that is now the point. In the future age, everything will be seen, made subject to him. But now we don't see that yet. That time has not come yet. But we see Jesus. That is the emphasis. So when we look around, we don't see everything made subject yet to the Lord Jesus. That will come. But our attention is not drawn to what's around us. Our attention is not drawn to us. Our attention is drawn to Jesus. Eight times in this epistle, just the name Jesus. And I have that on the outline. That is because the name is so important. Jehovah is salvation. He is Jehovah himself, blessed over all. But he is this humble man of Nazareth, Jesus whom God is crowned with glory and honor. The name Jesus, connected with other names he has, is 14 times in Hebrews. One time it refers to Joshua, who is a type of the Lord Jesus, in, in Hebrews 4. But those, seven, those 14 times where you have the name Jesus, 2 times 7, is again an example of perfection. But of those 14 times you have... Several times that it is connected with Lord or Son of God or Christ. But Jesus just by itself eight times. And that is what we have here in verse uh, 8 and 9. Who was made some little inferior. So this humble man of Nazareth, we see his, him in his humiliation. And we saw earlier, as a human being, if I may use that expression, he's higher than the angels. But in connection with the sufferings of death, in verse 9 here, he was made a little lower, a little inferior. Literally it means some time, so it was a short period of time. Secondly, it was a little bit inferior to them. So it was a limited a short time and it was also a limited way and that is connected with his sufferings the suffering of death as I said earlier the angels cannot die but the Lord Jesus went through the suffering of death 
This is unfathomable. When you see the Lord Jesus, that He would have to die. The Prince of Life, who could not be holden by the bonds of death, yet He stepped into death, yet He, yet he suffered death. And we see in verse 9 at the end, it says that by the grace of God, He should taste death for everything. This is amazing. We as sinners were supposed to taste death. That was the consequence of our sin. But He was without sin. And it was the grace of God that He would taste death. It's a terrible thing for Him to taste death, the Prince of Life. Death with this terrible smell, death with this awful taste, he had to taste it. And it was for everything. This was, it's also one of those sweeping statements, that with his death, God had introduced something that takes care of everything. So I repeat, this doesn't mean that everybody will be saved, because this does not set aside man's responsibility. But what it says is, that this is a foundation that God has laid through the Lord Jesus tasting death for everything. He has laid a foundation. And on that new foundation, God builds a new building, as it were. But it starts with this foundation. And then it goes on in verse 10. For it became him. So this is something that we also have a hard time to understand. This was suitable to him. It became him. It really literally means it suited him. Because now the emphasis is on his greatness. So he was able to lay that foundation once and for all through his, the sufferings of death. And this was God's plan and that was suitable to Him for whom are all things. And by whom are all things. So that shows the greatness of the person. He uh, is so great that all things were made for Him. You've seen in Hebrews 1 that He is the heir of all things. And here we see that all things were made for Him. Secondly, all things were made by Him. He is the Creator Himself. In Colossians 1 we see that He created all things through His own power, His own doing, and for Himself. And so here is one of those glimpses that show the greatness of the Lord Jesus. That by Him He is the instrument, He is the executor who does this, and it is done for him, for his own glory. But it's connected here, at the end of verse 10, with something very special. In bringing many sons to glory. He is a great leader. We saw earlier that God has entrusted to him the whole administration of this whole universe. But now we see a plan that God had. The plan was that the Lord Jesus would be the great leader to lead, to bring many sons to glory. In Hebrews 12, you'll see more about that, the great leader. Sometimes it's translated prince. And again, that uh, expression, what you have here in verse 10, that he is the great leader, and that he is the prince, you count those verses that he is leading, that he is bringing, it's the same Greek word, and that he is the great prince or leader, together seven times in Hebrews. It's amazing. And so this great leader is seen here as one who brings many sons to glory. I think in the context, in the literal context of Hebrews, if you keep in mind this world to come, it has in view here the world to come. 
that he brings those many sons to glory. That's the literal context. And of course we can make an application. We see now the Lord Jesus in heaven, crowned with glory and honor, and he has taken us and led us already to glory. That's an application. But the, the literal context here I think is in connection with the future. And it says here, to make perfect the leader of their salvation. There is the word again, leader. So he is leading, and he is the leader. And the leader needs to be made perfect. That is something that we have a hard time to understand. Is he not perfect? See, the Lord Jesus is perfect. There is sinless perfection with him. That's not the point. But he came into this world, he came to be with his disciples, he came to be the leader of those who was leading to glory, and in that context he needed to become perfect. Now, I repeat, that's not to give the impression that there was a lack with the Lord Jesus. Not at all, far be the thought. But the thought is that he had to go through a process he came into God's school. You see in Luke 2, how, he, how God wake, woke him up every morning in Isaiah 50. I, he wakes my ear every morning. He entered into God's school. In Hebrews 5, you will see that he learned obedience. Doesn't mean that he was ever disobedient. Of course not. But he had to learn what it was to obey. That's the point. And here it implies that he had to become as the expression uh, goes, to be made perfect. It implies that he had to go through this whole process, to go through God's school, to be taught by God himself, but without the thought that there was any imperfection, but just the thought that he had to go through this whole process so that he could be the leader, that he could lead those many sons to glory. So he had to learn because he's the creator. And now as a man, we talked about that earlier, as a man on this earth, he had to learn. That's what it is all about. And here we see him as this great learner who became the leader as such, as we have seen earlier, to bring many sons to glory. And so there is where the circle closes. And so he became, he was made perfect in order to bring us to glory in order to lead us on and this was through suffering the sufferings we see that also in Hebrews 5 are part of this whole process the Lord Jesus came to suffer from the day he was born the day he was laid in the tomb he was the great sufferer acquainted with suffering Hebrew, uh, Isaiah 53 and that is what we find here. The great leader is connected to sufferings. But sufferings, not because of any, some in him that needed those sufferings. Those sufferings were by the grace of God for us. But those sufferings were nevertheless very real. And you could study many scriptures about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. We'll stop now for tonight, but that will be a topic for our meditation. Because you know, when we'll be in heaven, we'll still meditate on the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. That meditation will never stop. And that meditation will lead us to worship. And so, I'm sorry, I have to stop here. I wanted to go on with verse 11 and 12. But the next time, Lord willing, we will see seven ways in which we are connected with Him. And so, from verse 11 to the end of the chapter, we see those seven different aspects that we are linked with the Lord Jesus. How blessed we are to have such a Savior, to have such a leader. Praise His name. Amen.